All right, everyone. Um, good evening. Welcome. Uh, my name is Elena Burke with Manatee County Parks and Natural Resources. Um, I'm with the Education and Volunteer Division. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for our virtual career night tonight. Um, you know, typically we like to do this in person, but um, you know, for now we'll try the virtual one, see how it goes. Um, we're joined by an amazing group of panelists this evening. Um, and we're really excited to hear their stories um, and hear about how they got into their careers in natural resources. Um, but first, we're going to start off with some opening remarks um, from our department director, Charlie Hunsicker. Um, Charlie, do you want to tell us a little bit about your career in natural resources and kick us off? Thank you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is Charlie Hunsicker. And, um, I'm here at GT Bray right now, and we're experiencing a monsoon outside. So I will say that um, when I make my remarks, I'm going to get my umbrella and try to see if I can get out of here before we get drowned. Um, besides that, the building closes at 7 o'clock, so I've got to go. But I do want to welcome each of you to participate in that uh, little uh, show tonight. Um, every one of you is on this video because you're interested in, in having meaningful change uh, to our environment meaningful uh, aid and assistance to the people here at Manatee County in the state of Florida. And to our panelists, I thank you, each of you for participating tonight. Uh, myself, I, I uh, went through, you know, I was born in 19, no, okay. But I, I graduated from University of Wisconsin-Madison with an undergraduate degree in agriculture, with, but more of, a, more of a focus on rural sociology and the movement of peoples, urban to rural, rural to urban, and uh, I kind of wanted to pursue that same kind of career in a in a planning planning mode, and uh, made application and was accepted at uh, Florida State, which it was University of Florida, but Florida State University in the Urban and Regional Planning School. And in that uh, two and a half year program, I also began to realize that my true interest lied on the environmental side of planning, uh, talking about how our natural resources can be better utilized for conservation, for sustainability, and and for um, supporting our important plants and animals in Florida. And through that training, I happened to get a, a landed my first job here in Manatee County in the uh, planning department. And at the time, we were preparing some long range plans for water wastewater, solid waste, conservation, coastal zone activities, even utilities. And uh, apart from other services that the county provides, I was fortunate enough to get be responsible to write those first kind of plans for the county. And I moved over from the planning department to utilities, where I gained a lot of experience in the water and wastewater and solid waste fields, and had the opportunity of uh, being in the right places at the right time to take on some pretty challenging environmental issues uh, that were faced, the county was facing at the time. The Tampa Bay was dredging and re, re, re dredging the Tampa Bay shipping channel and was looking for offshore places to dispose of this of the material. And we we guided that process to create a offshore dump site almost 27 miles offshore instead of a more close in dump site that the Army Corps and EPA had chosen. And that started my, that was back in the 80s, early 80s. And that started my interest in, in making meaningful change across the broad spectrum of, of activities to, 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 to gain, uh, in effect, a, a, a very worthwhile feeling about making positive change that had a lasting effect. Um, my parents, my father was in uh, sales, uh, millwork, windows and doors, quite good at that. Uh, but I thought to myself, I, I wanted to follow a career path, not necessarily in business, but in an area that could uh, contribute to our changing uh, climate, our changing world, and hopefully make it a better place. And working with some fantastic people here in Manatee County, past and current, um, I've been able to be part of creating some pretty decent preserves, uh, Robinson, Emerson, to name a few, and 15 others along with now our parks program. Each of these activities uh, lets me as a professional take a great deal of satisfaction of having the feeling of making lasting, lasting change 
and making a difference, uh, not necessarily in my life, but in the lives of everyone who is able to touch our parks and our preserves. So, you know, do I love coming to work every day? Absolutely. Um, and so with that, I want to encourage each of you as you think about your career paths, uh, if you're thinking about natural resources, conservation of our resources, sustainability, uh, even interacting with the public in our parks, you're on the threshold of also making a real difference and a lasting change, a lasting improvement um, to the lives of those around you, be they scrub jays or your best friends, your parents, and your children. So that's, so thank you for this moment and uh, I'll turn it back to Elaine. Thank you, Charlie. That's uh, that's why we're all here, right? To make a difference, and um, we love what we do. And you said that beautifully. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and continue into our um, panelist discussion. Uh, so the way this will work um, is, I'm going to just ask a series of questions to our panelists. Um, panelists, uh, you know, do your best to answer. Uh, answer honestly, um, our audience tonight is a mixture of folks who may be interested in uh, looking for a career in natural resources, maybe looking for a career change, um, or maybe a young student uh, looking to get into the field of natural resources. Um, so we'll just go around round robin um, to each panelist and have them answer the questions. Um, and then after that, uh, we do have a little Q and A box on um, should be on the side of your screen there. If um, you have a question for one of our panelists, uh, please um, ask uh, in the Q and A box. And then at the end of the program, um, we'll go through those questions and any that haven't been answered throughout the the evening. Um, we'll make sure to pull those questions out and uh, direct them back to the panelists. So we'll have a little Q&A session um, at the end. Um, so let's go ahead and start with our first question. Um, so the first thing is just to introduce yourself. Uh, tell us your name, um, your, your job title, maybe a little short description about um, kind of what you do every day. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with Sabrina. Can everyone hear me first? Are we good to go? Crushing it. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Sabrina Cummings. Uh, I'm the Environmental Programs Coordinator for Conservation Foundation of the Gulf Coast uh, Regional Land Trust based out of mid Sarasota County in Osprey. Uh, my general job uh, is teaching young people about nature. Um, so whether that's getting them in kayaks or taking them on hikes, any of that kind of stuff is usually uh, my job. So it's program creation and implementation, which is a little impact right now, but my general day-to-day -day during the summer would be getting dirty with a bunch of kids outside. Great. Oh. Sorry, I just had a big lightning strike in my house. <laughs> so you might hear some thunder in the background. Uh, all right, next up, uh, Greg Blanchard, if you want to tell us a little bit about um, yourself and what you do for the county. Okay, can everyone hear me? Okay, I assume I okay, I assume I can everybody can hear me now. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, basically, I'm in the Environmental Protection Division of the Parks and Natural Resources Department. The Environmental Protection Division is a technical services division of the Parks Department. Sort of unusual. It has regulatory compliance and, and oversight uh, responsibilities for the county. Uh, my job duties include monitoring the air and water quality in the county for permit uh, requirements and for our own information. So the county knows how uh, good the quality, good or bad, the quality of life is in the county. Uh, it is very exacting work. Uh, uh, audited work. Uh, we have very stringent standards we have to uh, comply with. It is very interesting and satisfying work in, in the end. Th thank you. That's All right, um, Rebecca, do you want to go next? 
Sure. I'm, I also live in Bradenton, so there's a huge thunderstorm going on, and my dog is very upset. So if you hear him barking in the background, that's fine. <laughs> my name is Rebecca Sullivan. Um, I work um, at the University of South Florida uh, for the Florida Public Archaeology Network. Um, and it's a statewide network of centers all across the state. Um, and my job title, I'm the public archaeology coordinator at the West Central Center for FPAN. Um, and so um, FPAN, our kind of mission and goals are to, um, we do a lot of um, outreach and education um, um, to kind of educate the public about the, the rich history and heritage and archaeology and amazing archaeological sites that we have here in the state of Florida. Um, we also um, do a lot of work um, assisting the Florida Division of Historical Resources um, with, you know, their their job to, to protect and preserve archaeological sites across the state. And then we also do a lot of work assisting local governments um, in, you know, and their job in preserving sites that are on um, you know, within their cities or municipalities. So it's a pretty varied job. Some days, you know, I'll be in a school. Another day, I'll be out, um, you know, out in the field with a land manager checking on a site. So um, it, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot. Great. Uh, next up, Eric, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you do? Eric, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry about that. How about now? You're good. Okay, good. Uh, good evening. My name is Eric Kaplan. Uh, I am the Energy and Sustainability Manager for Manatee County Government. Uh, the position is very multifaceted. Uh, as stated in the title, uh, I manage the Energy and Sustainability Programs and Initiatives for the County. Uh, that could be anything from a greenhouse gas inventory uh, that we just completed with USF. Uh, we've done uh, some solar siting projects uh, for various buildings throughout the county. Uh, and we also facilitate a energy audit program internally uh, for our county buildings. Uh, in addition to that, I manage some very talented GIS staff. Uh, they do a lot of different projects for the county. Um, a couple of sustainability related projects would be uh, we're doing a farm and agriculture map for UF IFAS. And we've got an ongoing uh, interactive level rise mapper that uh, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out on our website. It's, it's pretty amazing work that we're able to do internally. Uh, and in addition to all that, I also manage the county's drone program which uh, is very different, but uh, does have a sustainability component because we're able to fly and monitor a lot of the buildings uh, for energy efficiency projects and things of that nature. Um, so I've started uh, with the county since December, so I'm new coming from uh, actually the Environmental Protection Commission of Hillsborough County, uh, and it's been a very exciting ride uh, up to this point. And that, that's all I got. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, next up, we'll go uh, over to Renee. Um, Renee, do you wanna tell us a little bit about your uh, nature-related career? I'm not sure if Renee is still connected to us. Uh, kind of going in and out and she was out in the field um just prior to logging on so i think she might not have great connection at the moment renee can you hear us might be frozen All right, maybe we'll come back to Renee. Um, maybe her connection will clear up. I know the storm is probably affecting that as well. Um, okay, so uh, let's go to Caroline next. Hello. All right, um, I'm Caroline Ritchie. I'm a forest ranger with the Florida Forest Service. 
Um, so my primary job, number one, is wildland firefighting. So we're the people who get called to go out with our bulldozers and brush trucks and um, uh, suppress wildfire. Um, but we're also responsible for prescribed burning um, on both uh, state and private lands if it's ecologically beneficial, um, as well as assisting other organizations um, such as the county or Swift Mud, um, anyone who might need an extra burner out in the field. Um, we also um, are the regulatory agency here in the, uh, I'm sorry, what was that? <laughs> Are we still good? We're still good. Yeah, I think okay. it was Sorry, just, I'm it, uh, feedback. I think it um, might have been um, Renee's might have been cutting in and out. That might have been what it was. So gotcha. Okay, so we're also the regulatory agency here in the state in regards to wildland burning, um, and that's the goal is to to keep everyone safe um, and keep. Um, fire where it needs to be. <laughs> um, other than wildland fire, we're responsible for uh, maintaining our equipment, facility maintenance, and um, fire prevention education, uh, such as smoky bear events um, and forestry education. Great, thank you. All right, I think Renee, uh, you might be back up and running, right? Good. All right, Renee, if you want to go ahead and unmute and uh, introduce yourself. Yes, the unmuting part helps. Uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Um, my name is Renee. I'm a senior scientist with um, an international engineering firm called Atkins. Um, so I'm in the consulting side of the natural resources world. Um, one of the best part about my job is that I get to do a variety of different activities and sometimes it depends on the day. Um, so I'm very fortunate. I think it's one of my favorite parts. Um, so, for example, today I was doing a seagrass restoration job up in the panhandle. I'm actually in Port St. Joe right now. Um, but last week I was looking at wetlands in, you know, central Florida and I know in January uh, it becomes bird season and I'll be looking at birds over on the uh, other coast. So. Um, good variety of fun things to do, and I think that's one of my favorite parts. Awesome, thank you. All right, and then um, our next panelist, um, Marielle, do you want to go next? Let us know um, about your nature career. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Marielle LeMang, and I am a park guide at the Soda National Memorial. So. Unbeknownst to a lot of people, we do actually have a National Park Service unit in Bradenton. Um, it's a small park. It's not going to be a big flagship park like Everglades or Yellowstone or Grand Canyon or anything like that. It is still a unit of the Park Service, so that's um, kind of a fun feature that Bradenton gets to have. Um, I am in the Interpretation and Education Department, so um, I think like Sabrina, a lot of our summers are usually doing like lots of camps. Lots of programs um, and in the winter time we do a lot of living history interpretation that kind of thing too our park um, specifically its mission is to commemorate the 1539 expedition of fernando de soto but also in relation to that with the history of native americans and its location we also uh, get the opportunity to do a lot of other programs like fishing clinics and kayak tours and hoping to introduce archery in the near future. So we get an opportunity to kind of introduce a lot of nature and outdoor skills into our park in addition to a lot of the history side too. Great, thank you. All right, so now that you all have met um, our panelists, we're going to uh, get into a few different questions. Um, and like I said, remember the um, chat is there um, for you to drop any questions to the panelists. Um, if you think of some as we're going through and at the end, we'll um, make sure we answer all of those questions. Um, so this next question is uh, what type of schooling um, certifications, internships, volunteering, any kind of trainings um, that you did prior to getting your current position or getting into the natural resources field. Um, so again, we'll just go in the same order. Um, Sabrina, if you want to uh, start us off. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, I graduated, it's also raining here. I live in North Sarasota, <laughs> so it's just one big, yep. Um, 
I, uh, I graduated from the University of West Florida in 2015 uh, with an anthropology degree. Uh, my focus was in archaeology. Um, my one and only bureau is, in fact, an FPAN bureau, which is really fun. Um, when I got out of college, I realized that maybe archaeology wasn't going to be my focus coming out. Um, so I served for two years in the Florida Conservation Corps, which is a state AmeriCorps program nestled in the Florida Park Service. Uh, my first year, I did invasive exotic plant removal with a good sprinkling of prescribed fire. Um, so I also have my wild, wild wilderness uh, first aid and wildlands firefighter training. Um, my second year, I did environmental education, uh, wrote a, well, co-wrote a um, overhaul of an environmental education program with the uh, IFAS Extension Office. Uh, and then got a bunch of trainings in that. And that's how I rolled into this job was really wanted to teach kids things. And it just ended up being about the great outdoors. Great, thank you. All right, uh, next up, Greg, if you wanna tell us about um, any kind of trainings or certifications, internships you might've done before uh, getting into your field. Oh, hang on. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, you're good. We can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, I have probably one of the weirdest career backgrounds of the of the panel here. I have a degree in biology from Clemson University, and I started my career at Boat Marine Laboratory doing environmental assessments using techniques that are no longer widely used in, throughout the world. From there, I graduated into uh, a computer uh, data analysis and statistics, which is universally important. And I was very good at that. And then I went on to mathematical modeling, which has since exploded. And I had an incredible instructor and mentor in that that I still remember to this day. At that point, I moved on to the county where I was an early adopter of geographic information systems technology. The rest, as they say, is all history. I went into audited programs, air laboratory. Uh, I had learned early on in my career in biology, you needed to focus on the physical sciences more than the biological sciences to get ahead. And that advice was very valuable to me and very relevant. And I think it's relevant to today where collaborative work rules. Uh, as, a, as a capsule summary, I think that's probably the best, best way I could, I could put it. So geeks do rule the world. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. All right, uh, next up, Rebecca, um, any training certifications, um, maybe some, something you did for your degree? Sure. Um, so I got my um, bachelor's degree at University of Florida in Gainesville in anthropology, and I started out wanting to be a cultural anthropologist. But then one summer I participated in archaeological field school and I kind of got the archaeology bug. Um, and so that's, that's when I kind of started to pursue um, archaeology. I took a year off after I graduated and I worked as a teacher for a year and then I went to grad school at USF. Um, in anthropology, but with a focus on, on archaeology. And um, my kind of specialization in archaeology is um, more specifically historical archaeology. So, um, you know, um, kind of time period from European colonization forward. And a lot of the work that I've done is on more recent past archaeology. So late 1800s, kind of early 1900s. Um, but other trainings that um, have been really important for my career is another specialty that um, I have is with um, like remote sensing technology. So like using ground penetrating radar. So I've done trainings in that. And another one is um, using GIS. So I use GIS almost every day. That's been a really important skill for my career. 
Awesome, thank you. It seems like uh, GIS is a common uh, theme across many of the folks that have spoken tonight. So, um, all right, actually, on that note, Eric, you are next up. Let us know about uh, any trainings you have done, um, especially with you know some of the, the GIS work that you do as well. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I uh, achieved a bachelor's degree in environmental science from the University of Central Florida. And uh, that was what kind of got me my foot in the door uh, with the Florida Department of Health. And that was my my first job. Um, from there, I got a master's degree in environmental policy, which kind of opened the door to work for Hillsborough County next. And there I got another master's in environmental engineering, which led uh, my way here. Um, all of which, you know, definitely had vast amount of GIS courses. Uh, you know, physics, engineering, things of that nature. Uh, I would say for my position, um, none of those were, I would say, required, but they all certainly helped me get from one door to the next to eventually learn where I wanted to go, what I, where I could go. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, say that they're required, but it's certainly good to take advantage of the opportunities when they're there. Uh, and you never know what next door is going to open. There's a lot of certifications out there, especially in the sustainability realm, lead accredited certifications, things of that nature that are always going to be uh, very useful tools for you, uh, you know, to, to use in your tool belt. But uh, really, for me, it's been experience. You know, it's, it's spending time in, in either volunteer work or professional work um, and, you know, taking the, the doors as they open. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, Renee, do you want to tell us um, a little bit about um, maybe some of the uh, training or, um, you know, internships or degree work you might have done before getting into your field? Yes, absolutely. So my um, undergraduate degree is in environmental science um, from New College down in Sarasota. Um, and one of the really awesome parts about New College was even as an undergrad, I had the opportunity to do hands on field um, experiments and work with professors um, at that very young stage um, and start to kind of develop that passion um, and kind of admiration for, you know, natural science and ecology. Um, and as part of my undergrad experience, I actually interned for Manatee County um, Natural Resources when they were working on Robinson Preserve. Um, and that was a really wonderful experience and kind of my first exposure to like, uh, restoration and kind of these large scale possibilities of what you can do um, with, you know, land that kind of seems almost, you know, hopeless. So seeing that transformation and even as adults still revisiting that area um, is really special to me. Um, and that having that experience definitely was a good foundation. Um, when I was applying for my first job to have um, that real world experience in addition to the coursework, I think was super helpful. Um, I then went on to get my master's in environmental science and policy from USF um, and actually landed my current job um, shortly after graduating um, from grad school. And in the interim, I did work for another consulting firm and environmental science has kind of two sides to it. Um, there's kind of the contamination remediation side um, and there's the kind of more greener side that's kind of like uh, ecological based and you know biology. And I, that's definitely where I wanted to be. Um, so I made kind of a big change for me, you know, career wise. Um, and as I've kind of developed my career there, um, certifications that I've worked through um, are the Florida Master Naturalist Program um, which is really great for people who want exposure to all the different type of ecosystems that are out there, um, as well as some of the kind of foundational um, background on kind of how to do some basic field work and some um, basic kind of population counts. Um, and that program was really great. Um, I'm now in my sixth year, almost seventh year at Atkins. Um, and two years ago, I actually started working on my PhD concurrently while working. Um, and kind of to um, echo what Eric was saying a little bit, this isn't necessarily required for the position I am, but it's opening a lot of doors because um, I'm now going into environmental engineering um, and it's going to allow me to kind of specialize a little bit more and be kind of more of um, an expert in some of the areas that I want to develop. Um, and so that's where I am so far. I still have a long way to go. 
Perfect. Thanks. I think uh, one thing we, we kind of note across all of our fields within natural resources is that we're always learning. Um, we always love new trainings and learning new things. Um, so we're kind of always developing, which is really a fun uh, part of the field. All right, so next up, uh, Caroline, um, before you go, Caroline, for anyone out there listening for a password, um, the password is nature. All right, go ahead, Caroline, if you want to talk to us about um, your um, any trainings or certifications that you've done. Sure. Okay, so this position here is actually considered an entry level position. Um, so I am a, a smidge overqualified, <laughs> but, um, I've got a master's degree in biology undergrad. Um, I, uh, my undergrad degree is environmental science. We have a ranger here who's, um, straight out of high school with an AmeriCorps internship. We've got a ranger who's got a law degree. So he's <laughs> doctorate there. We've got a ranger here. Who's a, a vet from, um, the Navy. And so it's just all sorts of uh, people you'll end up with in this uh, field. But um, uh, a high school education is what's required at the, the minimum. Um, anything above that is an icing on the cake. And they do, the Forest Service does love to see people from a more of a diverse educational background come in. So there are um, awards going on for people who are coming in at a higher education. and. Um, we have a lot of um, programming with local universities to offset the cost of the classes if people want to pursue their education while in the Forest Service. But um, as far as what you need for this position, forestry ensures that you have the correct state certi and federal certifications within your probationary year, which is your first year at this position. Um, at that point, you're nationally certified as a wildland firefighter and first responder, um, and all of your continuing education and annual training are covered. I came into this position already certified by the federal government as a wildland firefighter through AmeriCorps. Um, I did a stint with the Nature Conservancy in Georgia as a preserve assistant and um, prescribed burner. Um, and I think that's one thing that set me apart from some other applicants. So my biggest recommendation for people coming into a position like this one is to broaden your horizon, horizons um, uh, with something like AmeriCorps volunteer experience before you begin your entry level position. Great, thanks. That's great advice. Any, any kind of volunteer work you can um, really helps to beef up that resume. All right, and Marielle, if you want to tell us a little bit about any kind of uh, degree work or trainings that you've done. Yeah, and I'll also echo a lot of what Caroline says, because um, that was roughly the route that I took as well. Um, so my background is actually in architecture. Um, and after undergraduate, I went into historic preservation because I was finding that I was having far more interest in um, history of architecture than I was actually design. Um, so I went to historic preservation and as part of that program, I did an internship um, with the National Park Service. It wasn't on purpose. It was just kind of where I ended up, but that was with through AmeriCorps and also Student Conservation Association, so SCA. Um, and you'll find that there are a lot of SCA AmeriCorps um, interns in the Park Service. Uh, we had two last year. We have one already this year. So um, it's another pathway to get into it. But um, after my internship and after I graduated, I went to the private sector. Actually, I worked as a consultant for a firm uh, locally in Sarasota. And so that's what brought me down to Florida to begin with. Um, and after working there for a couple of years, I actually started volunteering my time at the park as um, at the Soto National Memorial. Um, so after a few more years of doing that, um, an opportunity came up and based on the experience that I had before and also the experience that I gained while I was volunteering, um, I was eligible for the job and I was able to get it. So um, kind of a roundabout way, but I will also say to, um, especially when you're in school, sometimes you have to take those part-time jobs. And for me, one of the other things that was helpful for my career is that I ended up taking different jobs like food service, and I was a caterer at one time. Um, I also did retail, 
all those jobs as part-time as they are, they also develop um, skills in, in retail and customer service and how to handle, you know, now, how do I handle visitors? How do I handle young students, um, older seniors that come out to the park? So all those are experiences that I would say also accumulate into what I ended up going on to my application, my resume. So I could, I could you know, those are skills that I can have. So. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I think we can um, never, never doubt those public um, facing experiences because dealing with people is something we all have to do. Um, and, you know, having those really good people skills will definitely help you, um, especially in the interview process and all of that. Um, yeah, definitely agree there. All righty. So uh, we have a few more questions here. Um, what is the biggest challenge uh, that you have faced um, in your career, um, either getting into the field or maybe, um, you know, switching careers or anything like that? Any kind of big challenge that you have faced um, in your field or in your career? Uh, so, again, we'll start out with Sabrina. I'm glad no one heard me say, oh, no, um, I have to say. Uh, the hardest part for me was learning to expand my horizons. I, uh, getting out of college was very dead set on doing archaeology with the rest of my life, like thinking about grad school and all that stuff. And having to come, like I came to like a, a fork in the road where either I could continue on the path that I was on or go on a new one. Um, and an opportunity has had arisen that I thought was wasn't going to be for me. And I kind of lamented it for a minute. And now I'm actively doing what makes me probably happiest, like every day. Like I get up every morning with the excitement of, oh man, like what weird thing about plants is a kid gonna learn today? Um, and I didn't think that that was gonna be where I ended up, but I took the opportunity and then just stayed flexible. And sometimes being flexible is kind of rough. Um, so if anyone's thinking, you know, this is what I'm going to do, you may well do that. But if you come to a crossroads and you're like, maybe I can just walk a different way. Don't feel bad about changing what you like decide to do because the things that you learn now will definitely be useful later. Yeah, I, I, I feel like that uh, definitely has been my experience as well. Just kind of being open minded to a possible change if, if it doesn't work out the way that you thought it was going to definitely. Um, all right, Greg, if you want to tell us about any kind of challenges that you may have faced entering your career. Okay, I should be on audio. I, I think the. First challenge most people are going to face is navigating the uncertainties of the early part of your career. When you don't really know what you like to do, what you want to do, and what possibilities are out there. If you've got a, a, a more than normal amount of insecurity in your personality, that's going to be an agonizing time. Me, unfortunately, I'm more like Menachem Begin always been. I can go against the flow no matter what kind of flow it is. And I, I, I don't know why it's completely natural for me. And that has always served me well. Uh, it's not egotism. It's just personal confidence and know what my abilities uh, are capable of, of providing me. Uh, there are tools, exercises, approach to help you develop that. If that's an issue, I suggest people look into to doing those. I think you will benefit greatly from that. And I will just close with that little tidbit of advice. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right, Rebecca, any uh, challenges you may have faced in your career? Um, I would say some of the biggest challenges um, I've faced to this point have been um, getting through grad school. It can be a, a very um, kind of difficult um, process that can wear you down in a lot of different ways. Um, 
So, you know, I would just say, and, you know, I, I probably, I took longer to, to finish my master's than I should have. Um, but I, you know, as I was in the kind of writing process, it was, it's, it can get really difficult to like, to, to finish and to just do it and to like, you know, push yourself through. Um, and one of the things that I found really helpful was um, making sure that I'm still doing, always doing the parts of archaeology that I love. So when you're in grad school and you're in classes and you get, you know, really stressed out and you're writing and doing all that stuff, it's hard to um, remember kind of why you put yourself through this in the first place. So to all the um, the students out there, the grad students, like you are worthy of being there, like you can do it, you know, just write it and get it done. And also um, another, you know, bit of advice is find mentors who um, believe in you in archaeology. There are lots of uh, mentorship programs um, that different um, professional organizations have that you can sign up for. So, you know, having a mentor who can help you and, you know, be there to support you is very important. That's great advice. Thanks. All right, Eric, if you want to tell us about uh, maybe some challenges you might have faced in your career. Sure. Uh, I've, I think I've got two that will probably be helpful for everyone listening in. Uh, one is kind of echoing what we said before, and it's overcoming uh, a rut in your career, you know, once you're in it. Um, like Nick had mentioned, it's going to happen, uh, especially at the beginning of your career. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, you're not exactly at the place that you had dreamed about being. Uh, but the, the best thing to do in that situation for me was to change your perspective a little bit. Know that wherever you may be is uh, something that can be very beneficial for you. It doesn't have to be forever. There's always going to be doors that open, but there are tools that you're going to be able to gain from wherever you are at uh, in the moment. So try to kind of change that perspective, slow down, take a breath, uh, appreciate where you are, and figure out, you know, what might be the right path to take you to where you want to be, whether that's, you know, going back to school, the certification, um, but just understand that you're you're in the right place at the right time, and, and you will get to where you want to be. Um, and I'd say the second one, which is a recent uh, hurdle I've had to overcome, is just learning how to balance a lot of different tasks at one time, especially when you enter a new job. Uh, it can be highly stressful. Uh, you know, it's just something that you, you know, also have to take a deep breath in, you know, be appreciative where you're at prioritize your time uh, and you'll get past it. You know, those early stages of where you are in your career can be very hectic can be very stressful, but six months in, you, you become an expert at it. It'll be like secondhand. You just got to get over that hurdle uh, and, you know, just enjoy the ride. Don't, don't, for, don't force the hand, just enjoy the ride and uh, appreciate wherever you are in the time being. Great, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, anyone out there that uh, needs the password, um, the new password is now Seahorse. All right, so we're gonna go to our next question, uh, or I'm sorry, our next speaker, um, Renee, if you wanna tell us about some challenges um, you've faced. Yes, I think like, especially getting into like a career, um, especially when you're fresh out of college, I think one of the biggest hurdles I had was it was just very intimidating to be young and feel like you didn't have a lot of experience and you'd see a lot of kind of um, job postings, especially when you're, you know, got the piece of paper and you're, you know, starting to surf the internet and see all these kind of opportunities that are out there. And it can seem very daunting. Um, and I think like my kind of biggest lessons learned from that is like, I guess the biggest one is, you know, give yourself credit for all the experience that you have and, you know, put it out on the table. Um, I think we kind of doubt ourselves sometimes. And um, I think you'd be surprised if you start, you know, kind of changing that internal dialogue and start thinking like, no, like I can do this. I do have the experience. I am qualified and put your best foot forward. Um, that it kind of speaks volumes and also to kind of have that confidence. Um, 
And to, you know, as the last kind of question we were talking about, you know, doing the volunteering and internships and certifications to kind of bolster, you know, your background um, as you're trying to get your foot in the door somewhere are super helpful as well. And then um, when you're kind of going through that application process, you know, make sure that you're really reading the, the like the job advertisement, tailoring your resume to it. Um, and you'll find that, you know, oh, yeah, this aligns and this aligns. And I have experience doing that. And it gives you great talking points for when you get to the interview interview phase. Um, and then also, I guess, you know, aim high. Um, the position I have now, I remember reading the um, advertisement online for it and thinking this position sounds like a dream. It sounds awesome. And I was like, I don't have like the years experience that they're, you know, saying that would be suggested or some of the background and just kind of going for it and being gung ho and being motivated um, ended up landing me the job. And um, it was just one of the many kind of pieces to it. I think it's having that self-confidence and just, just go for it. Just try it, just put in the application and uh, you know, you might be surprised with what, where you can kind of get you. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to try. <laughs> All right, uh, Caroline, next up. All right, okay. So uh, my biggest challenge is something that's kind of specific to me, but I can broaden it at the end. <laughs> um, my biggest challenge is that um, historically, I am the first female ranger in my district. Um, and I think that ended up putting a little bit of pressure on me. <laughs> and I don't know if it was so much from the guys as it was me putting pressure on myself. Um, but I felt the need to um, to prove myself as the first female ranger because this is a very physically demanding job. This job, I am driving a bulldozer, heavy equipment, and so I felt this need. I need to be, you know, the fastest one on the the training track. I need to be the the best one at the pack test, which is the forty five pound weight vest over three miles in forty five minutes. I was like, I wasn't the fastest. I was second on that one. <laughs> um, I was just putting a lot of pressure on myself to kind of prove what I could do as a woman in this field because I felt eyes were on me because this was kind of groundbreaking for this district. There are other districts that have had females in the past. Um, what I would recommend <laughs> to other people based on that um, and what I've learned in it is um, we are all gonna put pressure on ourselves about something. Um, for me, it was my performance because of um, just the, the novelty of having a female in this role. But um, whatever pressures we're putting on ourselves, we have to realize that our career is not a sprint and it's gonna be so easy to burn out. We're in a marathon. And so what's going to um, settle us into the job is not how oh, wonderfully we're completing every task we're doing, but it's gonna be the longevity. Um, and I found that to be the case with my relationship with my male coworkers. What's not going to make me fit this position, it's it's not gonna be the way that I perform expertly at this, 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 and this. It's not how well I can do an oil change on a vehicle, no. <laughs> it's going to be long-term, am I performing my job well over time? And um, and that's that's the case. I have a really good relationship with my coworkers. They know that I'm confident at my job and it's time that told them that, not sprinting. <laughs> so. Awesome, thank you. All right, and Marielle, if you wanna to talk to us about um, any challenges you might've faced. Yeah, so especially in the beginning, um, you know, and this isn't really even my first career choice. I kind of just ended up in it, and in that was part of the challenge. Um, because my experience was so far different than what I think a lot of people that go as a park ranger start with, um, you know, I didn't have the biology degree. I didn't have um, a science or any type of um, physical science type of degree. I had one in design, so I kind of had to figure out what it was that I wanted to do, or at least have an inkling of it, figure out how to get there, and also just kind of um, just learn for myself that there is more than one way to get to that point. Um, it's not necessarily the specific track that, um, you know, my track isn't gonna necessarily work for someone else, but 
when you get there, that's part of the beauty of it, right? Like you're bringing, each person is bringing their own experience to um, that job, to that position, to that department. Um, a lot of that diversity is kind of what makes, I think, overall that program much more full and much more rich. Um, and then also to focus a little bit on what Eric had said too, is like learning that balance of trying to figure out how do you do all these multiple tasks um, you want to impress and you want to do well, but you got to also figure out kind of um, what are those things that you can really focus on well, as well as develop those tasks in the future for the future so that you can get to like a really well-rounded program or talk or project or all the above. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, and our uh, next question. Um, we just have a couple more. Um, so the next question is, uh, what is one way um, that we can make the field of science and natural resources more inclusive to people who are um, trying to enter the field? And Sabrina, you want to go ahead and start us off? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I really do think it starts with so, uh, because we like to theoretically like train and work with our own replacements in a career aspect, right? Um, I, I do think that it hmm, making it more inclusive to everyone also means giving everyone the opportunities that they would need in order to be qualified or even think that they're qualified or interested in the things that we do. Um, so I think the more education that's out there, the more that we're willing to open up to our communities and talk about the things that we do. A lot of people don't know, you know, what a conservancy is or what a land trust is or why the foresters keep setting things on fire. Like, why do you do that? Um, and taking the time to really talk to people and especially young people, whether or not they're going to be, you know, like, they're like, oh, I'm going to be a doctor. Like, why do I have to know about trees? And we're like, you might end up a forester, you don't know. Um, I think it'll be more inclusive once we also open up ourselves to have those really kind of fun dialogues and conversations about what we do, why we do it, and why everyone should really be interested. Awesome, thank you. All right, Greg, uh, do you have any ideas for um, what we, we make our field more inclusive um, for folks trying to enter the field? Hello. Uh, I have thought about this several times, and I, I just think it's best dealt at a much more fundamental level. We don't see a lot of applicants in the environmental sciences, natural resources fields that uh do extend into other uh, uh ethnic uh ethnic minorities uh very very much uh cultural backgrounds uh, I, I don't know why it's just not cool or trendy or accepted i don't know if we as a hiring agency can do more than say we will interview and 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 and, and, uh, and rate equitably any applicants for positions, and I believe we do do that. We have a very good process for for handling those issues. So I'm unfortunately one of those ones that is really puzzled by it, because I I, I know that the work we do would benefit from a broader workforce. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Rebecca, any um, things you can uh, think of that might make our field more inclusive um, or uh, for those who might be trying to enter the field? Sure. Um, I mean, archaeology as a field of study is very overwhelmingly white and majority male at the kind of higher level jobs. And so this is something that um, a lot of professional organizations in archaeology have been kind of 
looking at, um, you know, some for much longer than others, but um, one of the one of the things, um, and you know, I totally agree with what Sabrina said that we have to like let people know that this is like a field that is for them and that you know that they can be interested in and this is open to them. But then once people get interested, um, you have to, you know, make it accessible too. Like a lot of us talked about having um, you know, volunteering and having probably like unpaid internships and that sort of a thing to kind of, you know, get the experience that we needed. Not everybody has the luxury of, you know, doing an unpaid internship or volunteering like in archaeology, um, you know, a basic kind of part of archaeological training is doing a field school, which could be like six to eight weeks. So like not everyone can take six to eight weeks when they can't work and then, you know, go off to some random location to learn how to do archaeology. So if we don't have um, kind of like pipelines of funding and mentorship to get people from like being super interested in these fields to then, you know, being able to get these same opportunities to get these skills to get the jobs, then we're not going to have um, any kind of diversity um, in archaeology or in the kind of environmental sciences. Awesome, thank you. All right, and Eric, I go next. Yeah. Uh, again, I think I've got uh, two points on this one. One being, uh, I just I think it needs to start early in school. Uh, I just think that school needs to have a focus on sustainability, environmental sciences, um, even a, an improved focus than what we have now. Guest speakers, you know, hands-on activities like some of the speakers, you know, perform here. Um, it, it just we need to inspire that interest young. Uh, so hopefully that develops and continues throughout their education where that is the career path that, you know, people from multiple backgrounds will, uh, you know, like to strive for. And then the second point for me is kind of the, the hiring side. So for, for our team, when we post a position, I like to include the requirement of education and or equivalent experience. Because I, I do not think that, you know, everyone is going, you know, the best candidate may not have all of the education credentials. They may not want, you know, want all of the education credentials. Um, sometimes they think equivalent experience, whether that be even volunteer or certainly professional in different realms, uh, makes, you know, the pool of candidates a lot larger um, and brings better candidates. You know, sometimes that ultra educated, you know, PhD may not be the right person you're looking for, but the person, you know, who couldn't obtain the, the higher education degree is the best candidate. Um, so I like adding that caveat when we post jobs, you know, that it's and or equivalent experience. And then here in Manatee County, we use a program called Spark Hire, which is kind of a little step in between, you know, your paper PDF application and a file, final interview, it gives uh, a larger pool of candidates to do, you know, about a 10 minute Q and A. And so that way you can quickly see a lot more candidates uh, than you might've if you were filing through, you know, a lot of applications and it gives a lot more people a chance. So I, I think that's been very beneficial, at least on my end. Awesome, thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, and Renee, um, any, uh, ideas you might have for um, making the field more inclusive to those trying to enter. Yes, I think one of like the really special um, opportunities that we have or a lot of us have in like the environmental science field is that you are interacting not only with the environment, but the people in the environment. Um, so whether, you know, you're running into people in public spaces, uh, we do like a lot of restoration projects at, you know, parks or kind of public city owned um, land where you'll run into recreational users um, or sometimes even if it's you know as um, kind of tangential as you know you're coming back from the field you stop at the gas station you're wearing your waders you're covered in mud and somebody kind of looks at you and is like what do you do um, you have this really unique opportunity to share about what you do and explain you know not only the career opportunity but part of um, whatever ecosystem or whatever part of nature you're working with and what you're doing out there um, and I think a lot of times you'll find that people aren't aware that those opportunities exist or that 
people do what we do. Um, and so I think taking those few moments sometimes to talk to a perfect stranger and kind of tell them why you're covered in mud or, um, you know, a lot of times we get people looking at us funny. They're like, you get a, to use a boat for work. And, um, you know, as you're driving through somewhere and you're like, yes, like you can have a job where you were out on the water all day, um, you know, in seagrass, you know, collecting samples or um, kind of monitoring the health. And um, I you know, hope that that kind of sparks people along the way. And then kind of on a more internal side, kind of what Carolyn was talking about, about, you know, being a woman in science sometimes can be very challenging. Um, and having to kind of, you know, feel that you can still perform the same way or that you have the same capabilities. Um, and it's just to, um, I think it's really important to help lift up your other coworkers and not so much be the race of, I need to succeed more or quicker up the ladder um, or get higher pay or get more of anything. Um, and just to kind of free everybody with respect and help other folks, bring them up with you. Um, don't necessarily try to keep them down so you can kind of keep going further up. Awesome, thank you. All right, and Caroline. I'm gonna echo Eric a little bit, but um, I found, um, not only, I mean, n not specifically for this career, but in just my past careers in science in general, um, the master's is the new bachelor's. And it it really is a very competitive field. Um, and I think what would make it more inclusive would be having more entry level positions so people can get in taste it, decide they love it, and then continue with their degree. Um, like I was saying, like some organizations do help train or even uh, supplement for college education. And I would love to see that in more organizations um, because if our only way to get into the field are these unpaid internships, then like not everyone's gonna be able to do it. Yeah, the, the unpaid internships are definitely a challenge of, of this field, um, you know, kind of in all aspects. I think there are a lot of unpaid internships out there. Um, okay, and Marielle? Yeah, so I think a lot of it as well is um, also engaging, especially young students when um, just with really even simple outdoor tasks, right? Like I think a lot of us who are in the environment are we kind of got our love for the outdoors and our passion at a really young age, I would guess. And so it kind of just followed us through as we got into our careers. It and then so I think if you can get um, some sort of engaging opportunity that begins that passion for the outdoors and for nature or archaeology or design or whatever it is. Um, as they continue to get older, you know, my hope is that in 10, 15 years, all of those entry positions where you need to start your career in the outdoors and, and in the environment um, are going to be a lot more broad and hopefully a lot more easy to get into. Um, but I think a lot of that does just start at a younger age. Um, another thing, too, I think is also one thing that we're trying to do is also to be a little bit more purposeful with some of the partners and programs that we do. Um, it wasn't, and I say that, and I was going to tell a story of how it wasn't entirely on purpose, but we do have, um, with one of our, our programs, it began with a woman who started um, a meetup group and just wanted to organize something for herself and her own little group. And what that ended up um, turning into was um, a women's only motorcycle club that ended up coming out to the park and kind of getting engaged that way. So sometimes those opportunities are a little bit more tangential. They're not exactly more direct. But um, I think if people really wanted to share that, that passion, what that love is, then they'll find a way to do it. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and then our, our last uh, question before we um, start getting into our chat questions, we've got, uh, right now we've got about three or four questions in the chat. Um, uh, anyone out there listening, please um, put your questions in the chat because that'll be our next uh, next thing that we'll touch on. Um, so if you do have any of those um, questions, put them in the Q and A, um, and we'll get to them after this round. Um, the password is now Scallop for anyone who needs that password. Scallop. 
Um, and then, so this one, um, this is my favorite question. <laughs> um, but what is the most rewarding part of your job? Um, and I know we could probably talk all evening about how rewarding our jobs are. Um, but if you just want to give a little brief kind of your favorite thing, um, you know, what makes what makes you do what you do um, that that big reward um, as part of your job. Uh, so Sabrina, you want to go ahead and start us off again. Absolutely. Uh, a thousand percent. My favorite job is that moment where I watch someone get it. Um, I, I spend a lot of time with kids who maybe don't get to go outside very often or don't have opportunities to say, just go to a state park for fun. They're like, why is that fun? Why are you taking us here? Um, and sometimes you're like looking over like, I don't know, like pine flats or something and you're like, you see someone get it. And it's maybe like the best moment, especially when those kids get to see someone that looks like them, teaching them about it. Um, and that's both a really great part of being a black woman in my career like path, uh, but also something that's kind of challenging. But man, when they get it, you're like, yeah, yeah, you're gonna like trees forever. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, uh, I call those the light bulb moments, like the light bulb goes on and they're like, yes, this is what I want to do. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, uh, Greg, one of your uh, most rewarding part of what you do. Okay. I, I spend a lot of time measuring and quantifying things. And the happiest times in my career are where I can point to my own measurements and quantifications and say, things are getting better. Or I know why this happened. I can explain something. I can show people on a graph, map, or table what happened why there should be more tourists out on our beaches, more fish in our bays, more people on our, uh, enjoying our parks and preserves. That's what makes me happy. Awesome, so when your data shows, you can show your data off. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. All right, Rebecca. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I guess I would say um, one of the things I find um, most rewarding is when, um, you know, the work I do can help answer questions that matter to people today. You know, a lot of people, times when people think about archaeology, they think about, you know, someone with a little brush dusting off a, you know, a stone tool or something that, you know, answering questions that doesn't matter to their daily lives, but archaeology can be used to to help people today to answer questions for people today um one of the projects i've been working on for more than a year now is a lot of um cemetery projects up in the tampa area um and that has simultaneously been the most challenging and the most rewarding work that i've done in my career up to this point because we're working with descendants of those who were buried in the cemeteries. We're working with, you know, community that's around those places to help give them answers about what happened to those cemeteries in the past. And so it's not just um, an academic question. You know, we're actually um, providing, using our science to provide information that is meaningful to people um, in their lives and to understanding their their family history and their community history. And so that's, um, you know, very, very rewarding. Awesome, thank you. All right, and Eric, a rewarding part of your uh, job. Yeah, the, uh, the most rewarding part of my uh, job is the sense of purpose I've found in the position I'm in. Uh, and being able to, you know, gain that feeling working on things I'm genuinely passionate in, passionate in as well. Uh, you know, whether it's you know working on solar energy, greenhouse gas uh, monitoring, sea level rise stuff. Um, you know, that's all the stuff that 
I decided to go to school for and learn just because I liked it, not necessarily because I had a specific career in mind, but that was uh, just always something I kind of made a deal with myself is to do something I enjoyed learning and hopefully it would get me to a, a position that I'm in today to uh, work on the things I like that have purpose. Um, and, you know, fortunately, I'm in a position that I get asked to be on panels like this and kind of share my guidance and my journey and how I got there. So, you know, hopefully we can help others do the same. Awesome. Thank you. And Renee. Um, I think the most rewarding part about my um, current job is just that it's something I really believe in. Um, and I feel like what I'm doing is actually like a significant contribution, um, especially with like the um, ecological restoration projects that we work on. Um, it's in most cases transforming a damaged ecosystem, usually from some sort of development or kind of just way things are kind of changing um, and kind of restoring it back to a place where it's functioning. Um, it's, you know, improving water quality. It's, you know, providing habitat for animals. Um, it's a lot of times now, you know, the human elements kind of incorporated into it of how we can make recreation possible without having folks kind of, you know, degradate the area. How can you kind of marry, you know, conservation and um, involvement with people and let them experience nature. Um, and when all those things kind of come together, I think it's just really rewarding. And I think a lot of that stems from, you know, my internship at Robinson um, and getting to be part of that process really early on and working with the plantings and seeing how that land was transformed. Um, and, you know, still being a place I visit now many, 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 many years later. <laughs> Um, and also to come full circle for me, um, I now work for the consulting firm who did the restoration at Robinson when I was in college. Um, so that was kind of, and that was one of those, I didn't realize that um, until after I got hired and um, was talking to some folks about it. So it was kind of, kind of funny how things work out. Um, but to have those kind of opportunities um, and as well, especially with the threatened and endangered species surveys as well, um, to get to kind of intimately know specific, um, you know, groups of animals that you survey year after year after year and learn their patterns and learn, learn where they live and learn that, you know, by doing what you're doing, these survey events, you know, you're protecting the future generations of that species, you're protecting their habitats, you're protecting their young um, from, you know, the kind of development activities that are going to, they're going to go on, um, you know, within those kind of areas. Um, and it's just fun because at the end of the day, no matter, I feel like what I do in the field, I love getting to tell anybody about it. And pretty much I'm sending pictures to everybody all day long of like, what are you doing today? Here's what I'm doing today. No, I couldn't find that bird today. I saw it yesterday though. And, um, I just really enjoy kind of having that dialogue as part of it because it is a very, um, it's a very, very big pride point for me. Great. Thank you. All right. And, uh, Caroline. You want to tell us what um, a rewarding part of your job is? Well, originally, <laughs> the rewarding part of my job was the variety. Um, outside of the pandemic, the job is very um, varied. <laughs> we um, some days will be assisting uh, with prescribed burning, or we'll be going to a school as Smokey Bear. Um, other days, we're servicing equipment, which taught me so much about mechanics and. Other days, we're, we're getting to continue education with training about fire. I went to a fire behavior analysis workshop. That was just wonderful because I do like the numbers. Um, but variety was it, and then it just got one-upped all of a sudden. Um, uh, so we are consistently on call to respond to wildfire. Um, and that I found that that was just an amazing experience for me because in other jobs, I've been a prescribed burner. I've done that before, but it wasn't until a recent fire that I made the connection of what we're really doing. Um, we had stopped a fire in a wildland urban interface. Um, so that's the area where uh, people meet nature, <laughs> where the leaves meet the eaves is what we say. Um, and there was a point at which we were able to save all the homes that were there. And I'd never made that connection um, when it came to fire because I've always been out on a preserve um, as a prescribed burner. It wasn't until the next day we went back to rehab our lines to just be responsible stewards and we were smoothing it all back out that I saw somebody had taped a little sign up to a fire hydrant that said, 
um, thank you for saving our homes. And oh, it just made all the difference. So. Oh, that's really nice. All right, and Marielle, if you want to tell us about uh, your most rewarding part of your job. Uh, yeah, it's actually, it's very similar to Sabrina's where you have a student or even an adult and they have that aha moment where they, um, you know, they see tracks on the trail and they realize what that animal is, or they see an osprey with a sheep's head in its mouth for the first time and they kind of, they stare at it for a while want to know more about it and they um, start asking questions and usually those are kind of the fun moments where it's usually that that bridge moment of where something cool happens in nature um but then it just gives you that opportunity to speak to it more and you know those are still the fun moments where you know you could I have to say you could virtually tell them what you want but you could tell them all this really fun scientific stuff but the moment that they'll remember is that moment that they interacted with nature and got to see that part of it so that's that's really fun we get to witness that and it's not even just kids it's usually adults too so yeah great thank you, thank you. all right um so now uh we do have some questions in the chat um anyone who's needing the password the new password is now ocean um ocean uh so if um, what I will do is it looks like, um, a few of our questions are asking about volunteer opportunities. Um, we do have, um, students here in the chat that are, um, either graduating high schoolers this year, um, probably going to be entering college next year. Um, they're working on their scholarship hours and that kind of stuff. So um, if you work for an organization that has a volunteer opportunity, go ahead and raise just on your camera, raise your hand. And um, I know not all of us have volunteer opportunities, so I'm just gonna have only the people that have volunteer opportunities um, raise their hand. So um, let's see. So Marielle, if you wanna go ahead, I can see yours first. Um, tell us about the opportunities um, for volunteering, maybe at DeSoto for um, either high school aged or college students. Sure, absolutely. Um, and I will, I will preface this saying that the pandemic has really put a hurting on our volunteer hours um, yeah. or virtually for about the past six months. Um, so I'll just kind of say this broadly that in normal times, and we hope to return to them soon, um, whatever the new normal ends up being, um, there's several opportunities, um, probably the ones, uh, that's a little bit more front facing and really simple is, um, coastal cleanups. Um, we do try to at least keep up with, um, the great American cleanup and also the international coastal cleanup as well. Um, again, this past year has been rough, but we do try to at least have those two, but we are more than welcome to have, um, cleanups more often. Um, and it's, uh, it's not uncommon for local environmental clubs in high school. Um, to come out and want to do um, just a cleanup for a day, or even if it's a corporate group and they want to do a volunteer day, um, that's fine. We'll take you. Um, for us, just being by the coast, thankfully, I will say the vast majority of our visitors um, are really good about picking up their trash um, and dog bags and that kind of thing. But because we are along the river, um, a lot of it gets washed in. So, and it's that's a constant battle. Every time we have a big tide or a storm or something, that's it's just going to happen. So coastal cleanups are there. They're relatively easy. Um, there's also opportunities in our visitor center whenever we get that back open to kind of sit at the front desk, answer questions, but also you can um, speak with our rangers a little bit more directly. You can shadow kind of what we do on a day to day basis. Um, it's not all talks and programs. We do a lot of behind the scenes works too. Um, and also during our living history season, um, if you are interested in getting dressed as a 16th century conquistador or explorer or something like that, um, there's that opportunity as well. Um, and then in the summertime, we would normally have our kayak tours. We're looking for help with that um, to just be that um, assistant to kind of help the rangers load people in the corral, like kayakers, that kind of thing. And we also have um, junior ranger camps um, we are always looking for camp counselors to kind of help us out with programs and that, and I will say um, the opportunities for that are kind of great. Um, we didn't realize one year that we ended up having someone that went on to marine biology after doing our um, since we call it in camp. So, um, and also going into elementary education. So that was kind of a bonus. It kind of just 
transitioned into other educators in the field. So um, yeah, lots of opportunities. Hopefully they will resume soon. All right, thanks. And I think Sabrina also had her hand up um, for volunteers. Um, so Sabrina, if you wanna go next. Yeah, um, so I, again, do most of our education. Uh, it's usually youth education. Um, so our events are usually for me, I'm busiest during the summer. Sorry, everybody. Um, and this summer was a little bit weird because I couldn't really do anything with people, but during most breaks and during the summertime, uh, I always need volunteers to help wrangle the cats that are second graders. Um, please, <laughs> um, I, I make, I make it a point to not let, you know, people of similar ages. I like like a, a power imbalance there with like volunteers and and students who are doing same, the same thing at the same time. Um, but we also have a generally kind of robust uh, events program at Conservation Foundation. Um, our events and rentals coordinator could probably always use some help. Uh, and we also have land stewards. We have a biologist on staff uh, who's also doing stewardship. And also our headquarters is at a preserve. So um, there's kind of always something to do, except for right now. Um, so I would definitely suggest if you kind of want to get into that, or even when we eventually get back to the office, if any of you are into like small office work, um, it'll really get you the ins and outs of what conservancies actually do and what we're up to all the time. Um, because there's a wide variety of tasks that make land conservation happen. Um, so definitely, yeah, let us know, just not like, you know, like next week, but uh, we will have volunteer opportunities coming back up pretty soon. Awesome, thank you. And I think Rebecca, uh, you had some volunteer and then after that, we'll go to Eric. Oh, you're muted, sorry. There you go. Obviously, normal times, we do a lot of um, education programming with like kids in all age levels. We do a junior archeologist camp every summer, but we weren't able to do it this summer. So that was really sad, but one um, kind of volunteer program that we have um, statewide. So no matter where you are in the state of Florida, um, it's called the Heritage Monitoring Scouts. And if you go to fpan.us slash HMS Florida, you can find information on it. We've done a bunch of these kind of volunteer events um, in some of the Manatee County preserves, and we actually go out and do um, site checks on archeological sites that are on preserve lands and state parks, um, especially ones that are in coastal areas and that are be being impacted by coastal erosion and sea level rise. So we don't do any excavation or anything like that, but we just go out to the sites, you know, take pictures and do a very brief assessment. And then I also, you know, talk about the, the history of the place and some of the archeology span and what we're seeing. So it's a fun way to learn about the history of where you live and probably places that you've never been to before. And also to volunteer and kind of see what archeology span is about. Perfect, thanks. And then Eric, do you wanna go ahead and talk about any volunteering um, opportunities you might have? Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to mention Manatee County hosts uh, what is called the Results First Internship Program. Um, this usually happens, I believe it's spring and summer semesters and the Energy Sustainability Division and Parks and Natural Resources both uh, generally participate. Um, they are paid internships as well. Uh, and they're very popular. So uh, I know this fall uh, we will not be having one, but if you check out the county website or I believe county social media, they'll be advertising for it probably at the end of fall. Um, and they're usually really good opportunities. Uh, you're very involved in the projects and usually present to our uh, board at the end, uh, which is you know always a cool experience. And then my team works very closely with uh, both Keep Manatee Beautiful and our UF IFAS Extension Office that both have volunteer opportunities all the time. So, you know, worth checking them out as well. Awesome, thank you. And I will also add to um, Eric's note um, in the, um, we're the, I'm part of the education and volunteer division. We also have um, volunteer opportunities um, out in the parks and preserves. So a lot of these um, involved, um, you know, doing cleanups or um, removing of um, in exotic invasive plant species, 
um, doing plantings in the preserve, um, very hands-on volunteer opportunities. Um, and also another note about re results first internships that are really cool is a lot of these projects um, that the interns are doing are projects that stick around. Um, they're coming up with, you know, really great ideas that the county actually implements. Um, so these, these internship projects aren't just like a little, you know, tiny thing that gets, you know, scrapped together. They're actually projects that the county can like implement and improve you know, our, our systems. So, yeah, they're really cool, um, really cool opportunities for results first. Um, so just looking in the chat. Um, yes, uh, I see someone asked if we could put a list together um, for volunteering. We will do that. We will um, kind of make a list and we, I believe we should be able to either post it to our Facebook event or maybe email it out. We'll figure that out, but make sure we have a list um, of some of the opportunities that you all have mentioned so that we can get those written down for folks. Um, we did have a question. We've gotten a, a couple questions about uh, GIS. Um, sort of, let's see, what would be the best course to learn GIS? Um, so anyone who has experience in that would want to answer. Maybe Eric, do you have to... <laughs> I don't know if yeah. anyone else. Would want to yeah, okay. uh, the interesting thing GIS is, uh, you know, we've got a couple of analysts in our division and uh, oddly, they, they don't generally require a GIS degree, not yet. They're actually uh, a pretty good position and career field to get into without having crazy education credentials, at least not yet. Um, really, I think school experience or, you know, any type of um, you know, entry level job that has GIS capacity, I would go for internships for sure. There are GIS certificates out there as well that, frankly, in my mind, I kind of look at as a degree in a way, because um, it's really um, one of the few educational tools out there for GIS. But, you know, experience really, when it comes to that type of software and that program, uh, you really have to work with it and you have to work with it often. Uh, to really gain proficiency with it. So luckily it's something you can get into without a lot of educational credits, but then, you know, kind of harness the skill and you'll be, you'll be very attractive for GIS positions, you know, after that. Great, and yeah. on, um, on our panel have GIS um, experience or, or know how to get certified in that? Okay. Um, um, Greg, if you want to go ahead and then Sabrina, um, after Greg. Okay. Uh, the best way to find out if you and GIS are compatible is to take advantage of many of the online training options offered by the major vendors of GIS software. ESRI has many, uh, excellent online training courses. You can probably still get uh, the uh, cloud-based versions of the software for no or very low cost and just sit and, and educate yourself in the basic principles at home. Just make sure you allow enough time to get through all the uh, courses to, to have a significant amount of content through and that will give you an idea as to uh, how how well you're going to be do, doing uh, going forward. All right, great. Um, so that was ESRI was the, the thing that Greg mentioned. Um, Sabrina, did you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, just a little bit. Um, for those of you that plan on going to college or are currently in college, there should be a GIS class hopefully just floating around you somewhere in one of these semesters. Um, I, I know that it was a big thing. I don't know about Rebecca's experience, but a lot of archaeologists in my program ended up taking GIS because it's just really helpful uh, for those who are in the field kind of all the time. Um, and for those of you who maybe aren't necessarily like super planning on going into this field, having it anyway and rounding yourself out is absolutely super helpful. And it's just a skill that you can kind of flex on people with. So um, don't be afraid to just jump in it anyway, because it'll... It, it, I'm almost sure that it will be useful almost regardless of what you do. Awesome, yeah. thank you. All right. 
And then let's see what else have we got here. Um, what type of uh, internships um, would you recommend for zoology? Do we have anyone out there who might have some zoology experience? Um, oh, Caroline, awesome. I remember reading in her bio that uh, she did some aquarium work. So Caroline, if you wanna go ahead and answer this one, um, go right ahead. Yeah, yeah, my my career path was a very roundabout one, but um, but yeah, I've worked in a couple different um, uh, animal care experiences. I um, I would say number one, uh, volunteer work to get your foot in the door. That was the way that I got into animal care originally. I was volunteering part time at an aquarium while working in um, it was an environmental education at the time, and. Uh, Typically they'll have you, most aquariums have it set up where you have to work in education for like 50 hours. Then after that, you get to go behind the scenes and like do the animal care. Um, so I'd say just stick it out, um, get some experience in it. And that makes you more likely to get hired for either paid or unpaid internships as well as uh, seasonal positions. Um, many of, especially zoos, um uh, versus aquariums many of them have seasonal availability because you know the bears are all hibernating in the winter we don't need as many people feeding the bears you know <laughs> and so uh the animals are more active in the summer a lot of them are going to have part time or excuse me full-time temporary positions in the summer months um and so getting in makes it so that you can either continue on in that position as people say retire move on or at least you'll have that experiment experience on your resume to go into another position. Great, thank you. Um, I also started out before getting into education. Um, I did some zoo internships um, myself working at um, Audubon Zoo and I also worked for a big cat rescue. Um, and I think the one of the best resources I found was the AZA um, website. They are constantly posting internships from all over the country. Um, and they're always looking, you know, like those seasonal internships are really great, especially if you have a summer off or if you've got, you know, need to fill some short amount of time. Um, the, that website really helped me to, to find my internships. Um, also, if you're looking for internships in that field, just apply for anything, <laughs> anything and everything, um, because you never know what you might want to do. Um, I know that I, I started off wanting to do marine related things, but, um, you know, I found that I also really liked working with tigers. So, you know, you never know what, uh, what's going to be your passion until you try it. Um, and that's kind of really the purpose of internships, I think, too, um, is to learn and build experience, but also just to try it out, like to see if you really do um, like it and if you really want to go into that field. Um, uh, anyone else with a zoology background that they want to share? All right. And I think one last question that I saw in the chat um, is. Uh, this might be for Rebecca, I believe, um, the field, uh, getting into the field of heritage and historical interpretation. So either probably Rebecca, Marielle, I see uh, Sabrina also nodding her head. Um, uh, specifically, it's a very niche field, the, the person is question um, says in uh, heritage and historical interpretation. Um, so, Rebecca, if you want to go ahead and go first, um, and then we will uh, go to the others. Sure. Um, one thing that I would say, um, if you're interested in doing, um, like, heritage interpretation and that sort of a thing is um, look into doing um, the National Association of Interpreters has a certified interpreted and certified interpretive guide training. Um, and Everyone in FPAN, we all do that training when we first start, and it's very helpful in learning how to make those connections for people. Um, we're talking about, you know, history and historic sites, doing it in an engaging and inspiring way. Um, and so I would highly recommend looking into that if you're specifically interested in that sort of 
heritage interpretation field. Awesome. And um, Sabrina, would you like to go next? Sure. I was honestly going to say the same thing. NAI is really a great resource. And also make sure you're still getting like the hands on um, time uh, because you'll be better able, I think, to make help make those connections um, by being a part of like either the field work or any kind of like behind the scenes stuff will make it more into like internalized for you, which makes you better able to interpret it uh, out. Awesome, thank you. And uh, Marielle, do you have anything to add about um, heritage interpretation? Yeah, um, so NII is a really good source. And also if you just wanna do some reading, um, kind of like the, the quote unquote Bible of interpretation when it comes to heritage, just Freeman Tilden's Interpreting Our Heritage. Um, really old book, 1957. It's about, you know, when we're talking about park service and giving talks and programs, it's about as fundamental as you could probably get. Um, a lot of the modern, um, ideas and theories are based off of that. Some of them have been tweaked a little bit over time as just normal culture and thoughts and theories change a little bit, but um, that's one resource you can start reading. Um, and also a lot of it is as far as getting hands in, hands on into this um, is to, um, I know I keep harping on volunteering, but volunteering is a really big way to start getting your face out there, right? Like if you wanna be an interpretation, you're gonna be that frontline person. You really have to start practicing. Um, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a national park either um, that specializes in history. It could be history. It could be um, maybe a talk or program in a library. Um, there's also a lot of um, reenactment groups. Um, we've got several in our local area. Um, at one point there was one that played um, um, Captain Calderon that is now um, he's a very active interpreter in our or in volunteer at our park as well. Um, you know, at our just in Tampa Bay, there's just a lot of reenactment groups. 16th century Spanish is the group that we interact with the most for obvious reasons because that's our park. But there is a lot of um, just reenactment groups everywhere. So if you can get it into one of those, or if you just want to pick their brain a little bit on how to actually start getting some face time into um, interpretation. Um, I'm pretty sure the museums in the local area would love to have another volunteer to kind of start learning and getting into that process and start developing programs. Um, a lot of interpretation is also knowing the material. So if there is a topic or a theme that you really want to do, maybe it's Spanish architecture. So maybe going down to historic Spanish point is something that you might want to go down and do. Um, so yeah, there's lots of lots of ways to get into it, but if you really want to get into it, a lot of it and what's gonna kind of set you apart from in the field is getting that experience. And sometimes that's in the case of volunteering, but get out there. So. All right, great. Thank you all. Um, okay, so I believe uh, we have answered um, pretty much everything um, in our chat. Um, so panelists, uh, thank you all so much for coming. Um, and uh, we hope that um, you all, all of our attendees have learned something. Um, remember uh, to check us out on Facebook um, where we'll be posting educational videos um, throughout the next several weeks. Um, and we've been posting videos about um, nature related careers. Um, this week in honor of uh, Labor Day, and we'll be posting some uh, more fun stuff. Um, I believe tomorrow we're going to have a video called Ranger for a Day. So um, if you want to learn what our park rangers do um, in Manatee County, uh, check that video out. Um, but again, thank you so much to all of our panelists for your time. Um, and again, thank you to everyone for attending. Um, and I, let's see, oh, do we have looks like we had one more. Uh, and the last password um, is going to be um, pine tree. Okay, so anyone needed that last password, we're going to be pine tree. So uh, thank you all so much. And um, I hope you have a great evening. So goodbye.